40 million men. Amputees in the world. So I would like to ask you a question. What do you think is the most common cause of amputation? I want to help you. I have prepared a pie chart uh, to describe uh, which are the main causes of amputation. The first one is trauma. So accidents, war, are you surprised? Secondly, we have other causes like um, cancer, but the big cause of amputation is poor blood circulation and diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So everything related to smoking, uh, poor diet uh, and uh, lack of movement uh, can bring uh, a person to an amputation. I'm a biomedical engineer and uh, I'm very interested in the human movement, uh, in particular in uh, disabled populations. And uh, amputees are a particular kind of um, disabled population because they need a prosthesis uh, to be able to walk. They need a prosthesis to be able to do everyday life activities. This is an example of a custom-made prosthesis. Uh, this is a picture from um, 1945, uh, and uh, this is a guy who was in prison uh, and uh, who was able to build uh, his own prosthesis uh, with the materials that he found in the prison. But the very first pioneer of uh, prosthesis uh, is a guy called James Gilligan. He's an English guy, and uh, he was able to provide uh, prosthesis uh, for more than 15,000 people uh, after uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. And most of these people were people from the First uh, World War. So James was, uh, um, was a worker. He had uh, a small shoe shop, uh, and he started uh, making prosthesis uh, by chance. So he made a prosthesis for one of his friends, uh, and then he ended up uh, making prosthesis for uh, many, many people. Then time moved on, and uh, nowadays we have uh, many, many different prosthesis, uh, many, many different shapes uh, and uh, models uh, that allow amputees to do many different kinds of activities. So this is a guy, for example, that is uh, ready to run. And you can see the shape of this prosthesis is very different uh, from um, the previous one. Nowadays, there are prosthesis that allow you to walk, that provide you energy. Prosthesis with a lot of sensors inside, uh, prosthesis that can provide feedback. So let me explain you which are the main components of a prosthesis. We have the stump, and the stump is uh, what remains uh, after the amputation can be below the knee or above the knee. Then we have the liner. The liner is the first layer above the stump. And then we have the socket that is able to connect the liner to the prosthesis, to the foot. The liner and the socket together, they make the interface of the prosthesis. For us, it's all about the interface. When we can accommodate uh, a patient's individual needs within a socket, uh, they have far better outcomes. And this is what Helen Harvey said to me one of the first time I met her. Helen is uh, the clinical manager at the rehabilitation center when I, where I started my research activities with amputees. And actually, interface is the very big problem uh, of wearing a prosthesis. Uh, because you can have the best prosthesis in the world, uh, the most expensive, uh, but if you have pain, uh, 
or uh, if you have problems uh, at the interface between your stump and the prosthesis, uh, you won't be able to wear it. So let's see together uh, which are the main challenges uh, of being an amputee. Stump volume. Stump volume is something that changes after the amputation, uh, and it changes dramatically. I put an example of a bottle of water, but I just wanted you to hel uh, help you to understand uh, how much does the volume change, uh, how much does the stump shrink. It's about uh, 500 milliliters or more in a nine-month period after the amputation. So you can think about which could be the problems uh, related to this shrinking. Fitting problems. So this is me wearing my husband's shoes. And uh, as you can see, it's not my size. And uh, I want you to think about uh, which are the issues uh, related to wearing something that is not your size. You have fitting problems, uh, you can have pain, it could be dangerous, you're not able to walk as you, as you would, and uh, you have hygienic problems, uh, so bad smell or sweating. Uh, so all these kind of problems uh, are problems that uh, the amputees are facing every day. So my group, uh, my research group, uh, and me, we decided to think about uh, possible solutions uh, for this kind of problem. And uh, we decided to use uh, 3D scanners uh, to monitor uh, how does the stump uh, of the amputees change uh, after the amputation. So this is me taking a lot of pictures uh, of a stump of the amputees. So basically, I'm using a 3D scanner, uh, and you can see the picture of the stump uh, on the screen of the laptop. And this is John. John is one of the first amputee who took part uh, in my research uh, uh, activity, in my research study. And this is John walking uh, with uh, one of his uh, first uh, prosthesis, one of his first uh, artificial leg. So I decided to monitor uh, the stump of John for nine months after the amputation using the 3D scanner. And this is what I found. So the stump was shrinking, uh, as I was expecting. Uh, and then I thought, OK, let's design a liner uh, that can be used for each stage after the amputation. And this is what we did. And we used uh, a new technology called uh, cryogenic machinery that basically is a machine that is able to make materials very, very cold uh, and create very precise and accurate uh, prototypes. And we created the different liners uh, for the different stages of uh, after the amputation of John. This is an example of liner. It's one of the ones we made for John. And as you can see, there is a small uh, cable coming out from the stump of the amputee because we wanted to test uh, if the liner was good, uh, if it was uh, good in terms of uh, pressure inside the socket, uh, if it was good uh, in order not to create any skin problems uh, or any other problems uh, because they, they have already many, many problems. And then we did also tests uh, related to temperature. We used a thermo camera to see how was the temperature uh, while John was performing different kinds of activities. And it did work. So we thought, OK, if it works uh, in the period after the amputation, when the volume is shrinking, uh, can the same technology work uh, when the volume is increasing? For example, with uh, children. So amputated children, uh, they have a life in front of them. And their leg is e expected to, to grow. So the future step is to apply the same technology to another 
population of amputees, the children. And this is a picture of a young girl who had uh, his, uh, her leg amputated in, Af in Afghanistan. She lost her leg because of a mine. And I decided to put this picture uh, because Afghanistan is one of the lower income countries. Uh, and uh, as Afghanistan, there are many other lower income countries uh, where there are many, many amputees who need uh, a leg or uh, a prosthetic component. So I recently started um, a research um, in Malaysia in order to understand uh, which are the needs over there in terms of uh, prosthesis, uh, in terms of uh, prosthetic components. And this is me working with uh, local clinicians uh, and prosthetists uh, and patients as well to understand uh, how things are working in Malaysia, if we can provide new materials, uh, if we can provide new way to provide prosthesis uh, for the people who live there. So my next question for you is, um, what do you think is the most common cause of amputation in lower income countries? And the answer is very similar to the one you saw before. So trauma, it accounts a little bit more than before, but still, the big cause of amputation is uh, poor blood circulation and diabetes. So what is happening? Lower income countries uh, are becoming uh, richer. They have access to more food, they have access to worse food, and they are facing now the same problems that we are facing here in high-income countries. So 40 million amputees in the world and rising. And only 5% uh, of those people have access uh, to prosthetic care. So I challenge you to think about uh, this area. Only 5% uh, of amputees have access to prosthetic care because, for example, they don't have enough money or because they live too far away from hospital or uh, because sometimes in their country there is no system, no education system who provide uh, prosthetists, uh, so people who can help uh, amputees to learn to walk again. So I challenge you again to, to think about these research area, not only in terms of uh, new materials uh, and technology, but also in terms of uh, education. So education to form uh, new prosthetists, uh, but also education to people uh, to think about uh, which are the consequences uh, of their lifestyle. <laughs>